SAT class. This is SAT test five, section eight. There's only 16 problems and they give you uh, 20 minutes to do the section. So it's a faster section. We won't get it done in 20 minutes because I'm going to explain a couple problems a couple different ways. So um, let's get going here. So E is the set of even integers. P is the set of positive integers and F is the set of integers less than five which of the following integers can be in all those sets? Well, first of all, we have even integers, so let's get rid of all the odd ones. So it would only be this one. All right, positive integers. <clears throat> positive integers, zero is considered even, but it's not considered positive or negative. So that has to go, and this one has to go. Those are the ones that are not positive. Keep in mind, zero is not positive or negative, but it is even. And then they have to be less than five, so we get rid of the six, and the answer is four. Just be logical when you do these problems. Okay, um, eight plus the square root of k equals 15, and what is k? Um, you can just do a simple um, algebra problem here. Subtract eight from both sides, so you get the square root of k equals seven. Square both sides. That's how you release a square root, is you square it. So you get k is equal to 49. That is that. Or you can just put numbers in. <clears throat> if you put, you know, if you put 49 in and square it, you're going to get 7, and then you're going to get 15. Hopefully this one wasn't very hard. All right, next one. In a poll, 35 people were in favor of building a new library. 14 people were against it, and one person had no opinion. What fraction of those polled were in favor? So make sure you answer the question question correctly. They always try to get you on those kind of things. So <clears throat> we want to figure out how many were the total number of people. Well, 35 were in favor, 14 were against it, and one didn't have opinion. If we add those all up, we're going to get 50. So um, they want to know how many were in favor, so it's going to be 35 over 50 were in favor. And when we reduce that fraction, we can take 5 into both of those, and so we get 7 tenths is our answer. There you go. Okay, so far not so bad. Alright, here's one in the figure above. What is the value of t plus u? The SAT questions are notorious for um, making you think that you don't have enough information to do the problem. And this is one of those problems. So if you know a simple fact that vertical angles are equal and you know that 70 plus 30 plus this angle equals 180, um, we have to know that these two angles also have to at, be the same as 70 and 30. They would be the remaining angles. So um, T and U, we don't know which one's 70, which one's 30, even if they are 70 and 30. All we know that... Um, T and U have to be the same as 70 plus 30, so the answer is going to be 100. So, um, let's see, is there a better way to explain, explain that? Well, we, ha we know that this one has to equal 80. I guess that would be a better way to put it, because we actually can figure that out. It's 80. So, we get 180 minus 80 equals 100. So you know those two angles have to add up to 100. That's a better way to explain it. All right, let's just drift up here a little bit, see what this problem is. Okay, it's a chart. According to the graph above, between which two consecutive years was there the greatest change? They're not saying which is the greatest improvement, they're just saying the greatest change. So you're just going to subtract. I can tell that this one and this one, it's a pretty great change. So if I subtract, um, 3.5 from 4.25, I'm going to get 0.75. So between these two, it's 0.75. Another place where I see a great change is between these two. I mean, you could eyeball it and say, yeah, this one's bigger, or you can actually subtract it. So we're going to get 4.75 minus 3.75, and the change is going to be 1. So the biggest change was between 1984 and 1985. So you're just trying to see where the biggest change is, not where the big, biggest improvement is. Okay, next. Trying to save more time on the more complicated ones. All right, the graph of y equals g of x is shown. If g of k equals 1, 
what is the possible value for k? To some of you, this is going to look totally like Greek or something. It's going to make no sense. What this question is asking for is for what, for what x values does the graph have a height of 1? This right here, g of k of equals 1, is simply saying y equals 1. You can rewrite function notation into this more linear notation by just replacing the g of k with y. So they're saying, see right here, they're saying y equals g of x. So you can, or and we're saying g of k equals 1. So um, we're, we're trying to figure out what are the possible values of k. And the k ones are the x values. What are the x values that gives you the height of 1? So we're saying, what are the x values, x values that give you a height of 1? I think these are some of the harder problems to explain. Height of 1. So here's where y equals 1, right across here. That's y equals 1, right? If we were to graph it, it's a horizontal line going through 1. Okay, which x values would work? Well, negative 1.5 wouldn't give you that. It would be there. Um, negative 0.5. Look, it's right here. When x is negative 0.5, it gives you the height of 1. So this is the only one that works. If you put 1 in um, you're on your graph, it's going to be here. It's not going to work. We're just talking about on the graph. Um, 1.5 is going to be up here. It's not going to be on this line. So the answer is negative 0.5. Probably not the best explanation in the world. All right, if a, b, and c are different positive integers and 2 to the a times 2 to the b times 2 to the c equals 64, then what's 2 to the a plus 2 to the b plus 2 to the c? Okay, they're, check, they're testing you here a little bit on your exponent understanding. So if I had x squared times x to the third, Remember, when the bases are the same, you add your exponent, so it would be x to the fifth. So we're basically saying we're adding a, b, and c, 2 to the a plus b, 2 to the a plus b plus c equals 64. What would that number be? Well, we know that 2 to the sixth equals 64. So we know that a plus b plus c has to equal 64. They have to be different positive integers. So the only combination that would work would be 1 plus 2 plus 3, not equal 64, equal 6. Has to equal 6. And this should be a 2. All right, so, so now once we know what A is, B is, and C is, we're going to go up here and we're going to plug it in. So let me just slide down a little bit. So we get 2, A is 1 plus 2 squared, plus 2 cubed, and we're going to add those all together. So we're going to get 2 plus 4 plus 8, and we get an answer of 14. And that's your final answer, it's 14. All right, so you need to understand when you multiply with the bases that are the same, you add your exponents. Oops, I'm having a little trouble here. So you're going to add your exponents when you multiply. Bases are the same. You add your exponents. And here you're just going to plug them in and get a final answer. All right. In the xy plane, the center of the circle has coordinates negative, 3, negative 7. So I'm going to draw myself a little xy plane. Here's my coordinate system. All right, and just uh, plot these points a little bit just to make it clear to you. There's my x, y plane. So it has coordinates, a circle, it has a center with coordinates of 3, negative 7. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there's our center, 3, negative 7. If one of the endpoints of the diameter of the circle is negative 2, 7, so let's go over here, negative 2, 7. That's an endpoint of the diameter. This is the center of the circle. So what's the coordinate of the end, other endpoint? So it has to be out here somewhere. 
the other end point of the diameter. This one, this distance from here to here, so we're going from um, 3 to negative 2. This is 3 to negative 2. The distance is going to be 5. So the, the rest of the diameter, we're going to add 5 on to the x-coordinate. So if the x-coordinate of the center of the circle is 3, negative 7, that's the coordinates of it. If we add 3, if we add 5 onto 3, this is going to give us an endpoint of 8, negative 7. So the center is going to be in the center of the diameter. If there's 5 on this side, then there has to be 5 units on this side. So the answer is going to be 8, negative 7, right there. The y coordinate's not going to change. It's going to go straight across. So hopefully that helps a little bit. All right, I found this one to be the most disturbing problem on the test. Um, a regulation for riding a certain amusement park ride required that a child be between 30 inches and 50 inches tall. Which of the following inequalities can be used to determine whether or not the child's height satisfies the regulation for this ride? Okay, one way to do it is you just start putting in numbers. Like you can put in um, the height could either be, um, if it's between 30 and 31, I put in 31. And then you also put in like um, 49 and see if it works. You're going to find that these numbers work for more than one equation. You also have to put in numbers that are greater and see if they don't work. I didn't like any, I didn't like doing it that way at all. So I'm going to show you the way that I did it. I mean, it's perfectly fine to pick numbers and play around with it, but it's going to take forever. I mean, the way I'm going to do it's taken forever too, but it's, um, it's just the way it works. So I'm going to solve each of these. These are all solvable, and I'm going to show you how to solve an inequality. So we're going to start with a. I'm not going to do all of them for time's sake, but you say h minus 10. Whoops, I ran out of room. It's not going to show up for you because I don't have that recorded. Um, I need more space. So let me just, I'm just going to have to squeeze in. Let's go back to black. All right, let's just use our space wisely here. Get rid of all this. Okay, I'm just going to do a few of them. This is how you solve an inequality. Okay, we're going to do A. So we say H minus 10 is less than 50. Inequalities, there's always two parts. And you're also going to say and H minus 10 has to be greater than negative 50. That's how you solve inequality problems. You set them up two ways. You say what's inside of there is less than this. You just re basically recopy it. And then you say what's inside of there is greater than the opposite of this. And then you solve them. You say h is less than 60. h is greater than negative 40. And you can see that doesn't, it's not between 30 and 50 inches, so a does not work. So you're going to work your way down. Let's do one more before we do the right answer. h minus 20 is less than 40. h minus 20 is greater than negative 40. And I went off the page. So you solve each of these, you say h is less than 60. And already that doesn't work because it has to be less than 50. So you don't really have to solve the other part, but let's just do it. h is greater than negative 20. That's silly. That doesn't work. Okay. The one that does work is d. You would say h minus 40 is less than 10. h minus 40 is greater than negative 10. You can kind of do these in your head. So you can say h is less than 50 and h is greater than 30. And obviously that's between 30 and 50, so d is your winner. I mean, even the uh, book that I have, Tutor Ted, he picks numbers, but it takes a long time to pick numbers. I think it's just faster to learn how to solve inequalities. These might come up again, so keep in mind you set it, you write it, as it is originally, and then you write it greater than negative 50. I'm not going to go into the whole explanation of why that works in this video. Okay, a right circular cylinder with radius 5, height 4, has a volume V. In terms of V, what is the volume of the right circular cylinder with radius 5 and height 8? So we have two little problems. You have to know the formula. Volume equals pi r squared h. So first I'm going to do it with um, the radius of 5 and a height of 4. 
So we're going to get volume of the first one, we'll call that volume 1, um, is going to be 25 times 4, which is going to be 100 pi. All right, we're going to do volume 2, is again pi r squared, pi r squared h. Uh, volume 2 is going to be pi. The radius is still going to be 5 squared. Now the height's going to be 8. And you can see it's just going to be multiplied by 2. So volume 2 is 200 pi. Now here's, I think, the tricky part. It says in terms of v, what is the volume? So you want to compare these two volumes together. Well, volume 2 is 2 times volume 1. So it's going to be 2 times the volume. So a little tricky in the wording there. So they're comparing the v's. The v's, it's going to be 2 times the original volume. V stands for the original volume. So that's how you do that one. All right, onward to 11. Oops, jumped too far. Okay. Um, here's a symbol problem. K, N, and R are integers. Let K, diamond, and R be defined and true only when N is less than K is less than R. Okay, this looks way worse than it is. So K is negative 2. I'm just going to put these up here. Um, N is N and R is 0. All right, so there's our little thing. Try to get that in there. Okay, now we put it into this little um, inequality. So n is n, because that says n. So I'm just substituting these numbers into this. So n is still n, so it's n has to be less than k. Well, what's k? k is this number in front. I mean, it's right below. I didn't really need to write that. So k is negative 2, so I'm going to put that in there. And what is r? Well, r and 0 are the same thing. So less than zero. So obviously n needs to be less than negative two. Well, negative one is not less than negative two, and three is not less than negative two, so the only one that works is negative three. So the only answer is one only, and that is a. A little tri tricky. The only part that's hard in this is it's a symbol problem, and you need to know that, see how they totally line up. So k is the same as negative 2, so you put the negative 2 in for k. I don't want to go on and on too much about that. Okay, a percent. This is a straightforward percent. 20% of x, so we're going to say 0.2x equals 80% of y. Which of the following, express, following expresses y in terms of x? Remember, in terms of means leave x in. So we're going to solve for y. So I'm going to divide both sides by 0 0.8, 0 0.8, so we're solving for y, so we're going to say y equals 0.2 divided by 0.8 is going to be um, 1 fourth, and that's going to be the same as 0 0.25%, 25% um, of x, so it's going to be this one. 0.4 is um, 0.25, and then you move the decimal over it, so it's 25%. So hopefully that one wasn't too bad. You just follow along and put it into algebra. All right, 13. x plus y plus z are positive integers such that the value of x plus y is even, and the value of x plus y squared plus x plus z is odd. Which of the following must be true? Okay, another slightly challenging problem, I think. All right, um, possibly the best thing to do is pick numbers. Now, if x and y are even, um, let's just pick them. So x equals, this isn't the only way to do this. x is 2, y is 4. You have two cases here. This is case 1. And then case 2, if you have two odd numbers, so you say x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 5, Two odd numbers when you add them together is even as well. <clears throat> so you're going to have two cases. Um, uh, let's see. They're positive such that the value of x plus y is even in the value of x plus y. So I'm going to put these in here. x plus y would be 6. So I'm putting them in this formula that you can barely see there. 6 plus 2 
plus z, okay, is odd. Now, in this case, we would have 8 plus z would have to be, um, let's see, did I add that right? 6 plus 2 and 8. So if, if this expression, it says the value of x plus x plus y squared plus x plus z is odd, what has to be true? Well, <clears throat> for this to be odd, z would have to be odd, right? z would be odd. Um, z would be odd. I'm going to have to read this in my book because I'm having trouble reading that slanted print there. Um, which of the following must be true? So, okay, in that case it would be odd. Let's just keep going here. So x plus y squared. Did I even square this? I didn't square this. It doesn't really matter though. x plus y squared would be 36 plus 2 would be 38. Yeah, okay. Um, next one is x plus y, so it would be 8 squared plus 3 um, plus z. And so that would be 64 plus 3 would be 67. I did bigger numbers this time. 67 plus z. In this case, z would have to be, um, to get this to be an odd number, z would have to be even. Some of these are really hard to explain. All right, now let's just go back. Um, <clears throat> if it's going to be if it's going to be odd, um, would x half? It says which of the following must be true? Does x have to be odd for this to be true? No, x does not have to be because we would just make z odd. So that's not it. X's have to be even. No, that's not true because we could change our z to make the whole thing odd. If z is even. Okay, that's this case. If z is even, <clears throat> no, actually it's this case. If z is even, then x has to be odd. Well, look, that's true. If z is even, then x is odd. So this is our answer. <clears throat> we can go down through the rest. If z is even, okay, here's z is e even, then x times y is even. Well, 3 times 5 is 15. That's not even. And, um, x, y is even? Well, it's even in this case, but it's not even in this case. So that one doesn't work all the time. That one's a little hard to explain. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, um, zero is less than x is less than one. Which of the following statements must be true? Just pick a number. <clears throat> I'm going to go with one half because it's right in the middle. So I'm going to say x is equal to one half. Well, let's just put it in each case and see what happens. 1 half squared will be 1 fourth. Is that greater than 1 eighth? Um, yes, it is. So that one works. So we circle it. Um, let's try the next case. Um, x is greater than, whoops, we have to put the number in. 1 half is greater than 1 half divided by 2. So that would be 1 half is greater than 1 fourth. Is that true? Of course it's true, so that one works. All right, let's go to the next one. This is three. One half is greater than one half cubed. So we get one half is greater than one eighth. Is that true? Yes. So all of them are true, so the answer is E. I like to put checks beside the true ones. And that one wasn't bad. If you know to pick numbers, you just substitute it in. I think that one's pretty easy. Okay, only two more problems. We're making good time. Of course, they have killers at the end. <clears throat> okay, Doug's biology experiment involved timing 12 hamsters in a maze. Each hamster received at least one practice before being timed. The scatter plot above shows the time each hamster took to complete the maze and the corresponding number of practices that each hamster received based on the data. Which of the following functions best models the relationship between T, the number of seconds to complete the maze, and P, the number of practices? Okay, this problem they are, they want to know basically what kind of line best fits these data points. So draw a line that it's the best fit kind of problem. So we're going to draw a line that kind of best fits all the points. I'm just going to go kind of like right through here. Kind of best fits is in the middle of all the points. You can't really draw any sort of diagonal line. So if you were going to like write an equation of this line, you would say y is equal to, it's a horizontal line, about at 44. I'm just going to put
put that there. I mean, I know the answer, but let's go down and look at the answer choices now. So the, the crazy thing is the function notation. Remember, when you have it in function notation, you can rewrite it as y equals 44. So you either have y equals 44 or y of p equals p. So these are p's. So you're basically saying um, it would equal 1, and then it would equal 2, and then it would equal 3. So that one's not going to work. Um, y equals p. Um, we don't, it's not 44 times 1 times 2 times 3, so that one's not going to work. It's not going to be divided by 44. It's not going to be plus 44. Kind of come up with your answer first before you uh, start looking at those answer choices. That one's just, you have to understand function notation a little bit for that one. But it's just the line of best fit. If you just look at it, it's a horizontal line going across 44. The only one that matches is this guy. Yep, that was a little hard. Okay, I kind of had fun with this last one. Uh, let's just give it a whirl here. The pattern shown above is composed of rectangles. This pattern is used repeatedly to completely cover a rectangle, rectangular region of 12 length units long and 10 L units wide. How many rectangles of diameter L and W are needed? All right, um, here's the trick to this one. If you go over here, you have two L's. If you go over here, you get three W's. So we're basically saying that two times the length equals three times the W's. So what I did was I found out that the lengths are three halves the W's. And I found numbers that work for the length and the width. So um, this is hard. There's no, there's no getting around that this problem is a level five problem. It's definitely doable and can be done, like they say, in 30 seconds if you don't have to think. <laughs> I can barely do it in 30 seconds now. So I'm going to pick values. Like if I let the length be, if I let the width be two, I can keep this ratio. You can pick different numbers, but if I let the width be two, these will cross out and my length is going to be three. So I'm going to say my width is going to be two and my length is going to be three. Now there's different numbers you can pick. Like if you're going to talk with Tudor Ted, he let the length be six and the width be four. If you put that in there, if the length is six and the width is four, you see how it's still, you get equals, it's going to be 12 equals 12. But hey, why do bigger numbers when the smaller ones work? So if I put two times three in here, I get six and three times two is W. So I'm just picking numbers basically, picking number problems. All right. So um, that means that each little block is six units, six, six, six units. All right, so they want to know how many of those little blocks will fit into a rectangular region that's 12 by 11. <clears throat> so we know L is three. So 12 times three, length times width, that's your length. Your width would be 10 times three. So I'm going to get 36 times 30, and if, when I multiply that together, I get 1,080. 1,080. <clears throat> now I want to know how many of those little blocks fit in there. This is the total area that you're going to cover. How many blocks? Well, I'm just going to take 1,080, and I'm going to divide it by one little block. Well, each little block we talked about was six. So I'm going to divide this by six and it goes in 180 times. So 180 little blocks fit in this big area. So your answer is, I know it looks like it was easy, but that's, this is a difficult problem. There's all different ways to do it. So your answer is 180 E. All right, so that is it for test five, section eight. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>